do it. Okay. Australia and Great Britain have long enjoyed a symbiotic relationship when creating stars. Everyone from the legendary Barry Humphreys, Clive James, Jermaine Greer, Kylie and Jason, to that old bloke with three legs and a wobble board who shall remain nameless, has been woven into the British psyche. What do you think it is about the British and Australian sense of humour that bonds us? And do you feel a sense of responsibility to continue this special relationship? Wow, that's such a good question. Um, okay, well, as far as as far as the sense of humour goes, um, I think I think probably what bonds us is. I mean, we grew up in the same comedy. Like in Australia, for me, I grew up watching The Goodies, Dick Emery, uh, Kenny Everett, Are You Being Served? Like pretty much every. British sitcom made it to Australia. So in Australia, we grew up comedy wise with a bit of America and a bit of Britain. So we've kind of got, I, I kind of feel like because of that, we're well versed in either comedic sense. So that's why some Australians end up in America and some end up in, in the UK. But as, as far as England in particular, I mean, it's, you know, it is the mother country as we like to call it. And, um, I don't know if it's the mother country or the big brother country. I'm not quite really sure. But it, physically, it's an easy jump to make. Culturally, it's a pretty easy leap to make. Um, so there is a great Clive James quote, though, that, um, that I'll see if I can find it on my phone and read it to you because I took it. It's on the writer's walk around Sydney Harbour. And I took a photo of it last time I was there because... It's a, it's a quote that really sums up Australia for me. Uh, okay, I've got it here, right. It says, uh, it would be churlish not to concede that the same abundance of natural blessings which gave us the energy to leave has every right to call us back. And it's, Australia is such a, a great place to live that it's very, it's very easy to make the jump to England because you think, well, if it, if it all goes wrong, I can just go back to Australia. <laughs> if it doesn't work out, I can go back and sit on the beach. That'll be fine. So, but it's a, it's a, it's a blessing. It's a double blessing because it's, we know it's always there, but eventually it'll call us back home. So, so that's the first part of your question. But the second part, yeah, I do feel a responsibility to carry on you know, especially when it comes to comedy in the footsteps of Barry Humphreys and Clive James. In fact, when we did the last leg uh, during the London Paralympics in 2012, I remember Clive James gave us a review, like reviewed us, um, reviewed the, the Paralympics generally, the coverage, but said, you know, that we were the highlight of the day. Um, so I kind of feel like in a weird little way, I kind of got a blessing from Clive James. And in fact, <laughs> I have met them both. I did a corporate gig once in Dublin and it was for a bunch of Australian white goods salespeople. <laughs> it was a white goods conference. And my job was to sit and watch the whole conference and then do a routine at the end. And the opening speaker was Clive James and the closing speaker was um, Dame Edna Average. So for one brief weekend in Dublin, myself and Barry Humphries and Clive James were all in the same room together. That would make one hell of a party. <laughs> well, that was a lovely moment. I mean, I spoke to them both, but <laughs> excuse me. There was a lovely moment at the end of that where um, Dame Edna's final thing was to grab someone in the audience, someone in Australia, and call their family back in Australia. Um, and have a chat to them as Dame Edna. And it just kept going wrong. The first person was so drunk, he couldn't remember the international dialing code to get back to Australia. The second person actually worked at the hotel and was the hotel manager. And then the third person he finally called, spoke to this woman's mum. He then went, hold on, before you go, I'll put my husband on. <laughs> and the hus this husband's like, who's this? And Dame Edna said, well, it's, it's Dame Edna possibly. He went, no, it's not. She's like, well, I, I, I very much think it is. And he said, well, no, it's not, because it's a bloke that does that, and you sound like a woman. <laughs> and it was unbelievable. And afterwards, we had to have photos together. And Dame Edna stood next to me for the photos, and she just turned to me and she said, were you watching that? And I said, yes, I was, Dame Edna. And she said, the lesson there is always drive through the skit. <laughs> 
And it was such a, it took me a while to work out what she meant. And in, you know, in car racing terms or in driving terms, when you skid and you start to lose control, people take their foot off the accelerator and that's when the car spins. What she was saying is when you start to lose control, just put the foot down on the accelerator and drive firmly through the mat. I, I, yeah, yeah, Josh used to love Dame Edna on Parkinson. Oh, she was amazing. She's absolutely amazing. I've, I've got to know Barry. I've, I've done a few gigs with with him and with her, with Dame Edna as well. So, yeah, that, it does feel like there is a kind of passing of the torch. And, I mean, it's not the same torch, but it also feels like there's only a certain number of Australian comedians that are allowed to be on British television at any, number, at any point in time. So I'm kind of... Feeling the closure at the moment. Yeah. The iconic Edinburgh Finch has long since been a recognised stepping stone for any comedian to grow. You won the prestigious Perrier Award three years running. How is the Fringe viewed in Australia and how did this help to widen your reach? Ah, actually, I was only nominated for the Perrier Award three years running. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to be honest, I don't know. I don't know that being nominated or even winning the award would have made that much difference in Australia. I, I don't, it, it, as far as the general public in Australia go, the Edinburgh Fringe is so distant and, and those awards are so far away that I'm not sure it, it, in and around the industry it would have made a difference, but I don't think it, to the public it, it necessarily would have made a difference. But it made a difference to me as a comedian because it... When you do comedy, you, you don't get a certificate in trade. You don't get, a, you know, a, a degree in comedy that you can say, yes, I know how to do comedy. So you're always wondering if you're just kind of scamming a living and one day you're going to be found out. I remember there's an Australian comedian called Glenn Nicholas once said, when I started in comedy, all I wanted was to be discovered and now I'm just afraid I'll be found out. So, so to then be, you know, given a nomination for an award, it's kind of a little thing that says, oh, okay, maybe I do know what I'm doing. And mm. I remember after the third one, being backstage at Late and Live, and Ed Byrne was standing next to me, and he said, I'm sorry you didn't win. And I was like, oh, thank you. And he said, but if you win the Perrier Award, that means you did one awesome show. If you're nominated for three of them, that means you've done three awesome shows. So, so in that respect, I mean, it, it's known in Australia amongst the industry what the Edinburgh Fringe is. Probably not so much amongst the general public, but what it does for you as a comedian, it, it, it just makes you a better comedian. It's like going to like an advanced learning or one of those, you know, over the school holidays, you can go away and learn maths for a month. And when you come back, you're a maths genius at high school. It's kind of like that. You go away and you learn comedy for a month. You do your own show 30 times, you probably do another 30 or 40 outside shows. By the time you come back, you're absolutely bulletproof. And it's only, you don't notice it because you're just doing comedy every night. And then you go back on stage in Australia in your regular club and everyone else is like, oh my God, you're, you've really stepped up your game. So it's, it, it might not be noticed by as much by the public in Australia, the general public, but it makes you a better comedian. And when you come back, it just, you, your skills are so much better. Panel shows are notoriously hard to perfect. The great Phil Jupiter once told me that it's harder to present a panel show than it is to merely be a guest or team captain. Ooh. But in 2005, you presented the Australian Spicks and Specs. What do you think it is about your performance style which makes you a suitable chairman? Uh, or two things. Okay, so firstly, when I started doing comedy, I, I, I learnt or was told that I was quite a good MC. So, you know, every, like there were loads of comedians around at the time that were, were doing 15-minute spots, 20-minute spots, but not everyone could host a show because, yeah, basically it comes down to being responsible. In order to host a show, you've got to be responsible. You've got to do your 10 minutes and then go, right, I've got to bring an act on. And then if an act dies, you've got to bring the, the crowd up to the right spot. But... You know, some comedians would go out there hosting a show and they would kill it for 30 minutes, like completely exhaust the audience and then bring on the first act. <laughs> There's the first act, you're like, well, you just, I can't follow that. <laughs> so <laughs> I think the first thing that made me a good host was that I was vaguely responsible. 
probably too, you know, a bit of a goody two shoes. I could be counted on to make the show run and, and ad lib a little bit. But when we started making Specs and Specs, they brought on a, a consultant, a guy called Peter Feynman, who directed pretty much every talk show that had been on Australian television up until that point. Names like that you won't know, names like Bert Newton and Don Lane, but Paul Hogan, he directed the Paul Hogan show. He also directed Crocodile Dundee. So he knew how to work with a comedian and an Australian comedian in particular. And I mean, Peter was Australian. But he came on board with Specs and Specs and he taught me the most important thing about hosting a show. He said, hosting, hosting a panel show is like hosting a dinner party where you're the host, these are your guests, and the camera is the last guest to arrive at the party. So you've got to explain to them what's going on, who everybody else is, and how they all fit into the party. And if a, if a discussion arises that they probably might not know about, it's your job to go, oh, we're talking about that guy that did that thing. So when putting that into my head was an amazing, like the host of every TV show should be taught that. It's basically a dinner party and the camera is the last guest to arrive. Mm-hmm. But even little things like, and he said, look, you don't have to, the, the audience, don't assume that the audience know who you're talking about, but don't presume they don't. So we might have had a game where it would be, okay, what do these three people have in common? Lady Gaga, Madonna, and Frank Sinatra. It's entirely possible that not, and in fact, it's probable, not every member of your audience is going to know who those three people are. There were people that know Sinatra that don't know Gaga. And he said, all you have to do is just put one line before them. You know, the, 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 the 50s and 60s crooner Frank Sinatra, the 80s and 90s pop princess Madonna, and the current kind of avant-garde singer Lady Gaga. All you have to do is just put that little introduction before each name, and the people at home are like, Okay, I don't know who you're talking about, but you've kind of contextualized to them. And there was, I remember having one of our early shows, someone mentioned Limp Biscuit, and Peter came up afterwards and went, What's a Limp Biscuit? And I said, Well, it's, it's a band. It's like, a, I don't know, I guess you'd call them a bit of a hardcore kind of early 2000s metal band. And he said, Well, tell me that. He's, and he said, and, and even if something happened on the show, someone mentioned a style of singing called Quay. And he said to me afterwards, What's Quay? And I said, to be honest, I don't know. And he said, well, if you don't know, the audience don't know. So don't don't sit there and and, and be silent because you, you don't want to look stupid. Ask the stupid question because the people on the couch will be out. They'll be looking at each other going, what's Quay? And he said, and if you ask a question and the people at home know it, they're just going to feel smarter than you. <laughs> and if they don't know it, they're going to be glad that you asked the question. <laughs> so it, it was like... It was like TV hosting boot camp that he put me through and every day was a different lesson. And I remember the last lesson he gave me when we did our first ever show, I remember walking into my dressing room right before doing the first ever show and he's just sitting there feet up on the table. And I was like, my brain was overloaded. He told me so much. And I went, okay, Pete, I can see you've got something else for me. What have you got? And he just looked at me and he went, it's only television. No one's going to die. And that was his last bit of advice. (laughs) so yeah i mean you know treat it treat it like it's a it, it's a dinner party but and and remember that no one's gonna die <laughs> so did you ever explain what limbiscuit actually meant <laughs> <laughs> not, not the euphemism, but just the band. <laughs> well, it's not even a euphemism, is it? It's a game. No, just the band. Just the band. <laughs> We've reached question four without mentioning disability. So let's restore the stereotype. Francesca Martinez and Lawrence Clark remain the contemporary pioneers of disabled people in comedy. How important are these figures in raising awareness that disability can be funny? Oh, hugely. I, I, I've i still got a film script that I've tried to develop with Francesca Martinez in mind because I think she's such a groundbreaker. And I think people forget she's a groundbreaker. Like I didn't, I mean, I, I knew her as a comedian and it was only years later that 
because you know I'd, I'd meet her in Australia when she came out to do the festival. You know, it was, it was only years later that I realised she was on Grange Hill, and right at the forefront of disability awareness on television. And I think she's amazing, and I think she's writing incredible plays at the moment as well, from what I can tell. Um, the same goes for Lawrence Clark. It's almost like it's almost like they were the disability version of the um, Little Britain sketch, the only gay in the village. <laughs> and I've spoken. It's interesting this because I've spoken to, you know, I've met a few people with disabilities who who grew up as the only person with a disability in their community, which I did as well. Um, but I don't. This isn't about me. This, but, but these other people have said that they they never felt disabled because, or were never treated as being disabled because they were just one person in a whole community. Mm. And I think, I think for a while there, probably people like Francesca and Lawrence, as the only gays in the village, in inverted commas, they weren't even seen as as disability advocates or, you know, leaders. They were just there. And yet now we look back on them and go, oh my God, they were, they were, they were cutting a swathe through the jungle when there wasn't even a path. Now a lot of us are just following the path that they forged. So, um, yeah, it, it's incredibly important that people like that keep popping up. And now, I mean, there's disabled people everywhere in the media, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, no, Francesca in particular, I think, should be held aloft, uh, and sometimes needs to be. <laughs> How important is it for comedians like you to make light of diversity in the 21st century? <clears throat> Ooh, it depends how you mean by making light of diversity. Do you mean shining a light on diversity or kind of poking fun at it? Poking fun at it. <laughs> So basically, Josh is someone who's always laughed at everything. But when you when you were growing up, you felt there was a bit of sensitivity around laughing at you know certain yeah. areas that they shouldn't have been. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I I think anything that's different will always make people uncomfortable, um, yeah. and it's not it shouldn't be our job to make them feel okay. But if we can, why not? And if we can do it with a laugh, even better. So, um, yeah, I mean, look. You know, I've, I've talked about this a bit, but I, I didn't talk about having a prosthetic leg on stage for the first 13 years of doing stand-up, um, partly because I was kind of advised that, you know, you, if you do that, you'll be the one-legged comedian and that's all people will, will see you as. And I guess what made me want to talk about it, and I ended up turning this into a routine, and I've done this a lot on stage, but it was after 9-11 and it was going through airport security three days after, you know, 9-11, and the security guard's getting freaked out because my prosthetic set off the metal detector. But then when I said it was a prosthetic leg, they were kind of like, oh, go through it. No, 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 you're right, mate. Don't worry about it. They didn't check. They didn't, you know, because they were too concerned to kind of offend me, basically. And, you know, I, I then came up with a line to put at the end of it that the guy had a look, the security guard had a look on his face that said, uh, I don't care if the plane goes down. I don't want to offend a spastic. <laughs> and I purposely wrote that line to be that way and to be that offensive because <laughs> I, the look on his face basically said, I want to do the right thing, but I don't know how to do the right thing. And even in saying that, I will probably say the wrong thing. But that sentence became the whole reason for me talking about my foot on stage is that I kind of felt like, well, no, check. I'm not going to be offended if you check that there's not a bomb down there. And over the years, security guards now do check and they, they'll... they'll you know, wipe one of those little bomb detectors over the prosthetic to make sure that there's no, you know, residue there, which is great. That's the way it should be. So, no, absolutely. The whole, I guess the whole reason I started talking about my prosthetic on stage was that I wanted to find a way to let people know it's okay. 
And it's, you know, then when the last leg came about, is it okay became a hashtag that we used for the Paralympics. But it was kind of just an accidental continuation of what I've been doing in stand-up, which is just, you just want people to be okay with it. Because nine times out of 10, you know, people see you on the street and they stare and they look and then they look away as, as soon as you catch their eye. And I remember, I remember doing a show with Tanya Lee Davis, who has dwarfism. And she said, remember her saying that she said she'll catch people looking at her on the street. And when she catches them, they look away as if they can't bear to look at her. And I remember saying to her, no, that's not, I don't think that's the case. I think people just feel awkward that they've been caught staring. And mm. she said, well, that's not what it looked like to me. And so if you can, oh, if you can get past that first moment of uncomfortableness, of discomfort, which we all feel, and let's be honest, people with disabilities feel that as well about other awkward moments in life, whether they're disabilities or not. Yeah, if you can use your comedy to just get through that first little bit of awkwardness, then it opens up so much more. Josh is saying it's a bit like when he's at a festival and he puts his leg out to get through people and then they end up saying sorry and he's saying, but yeah, but I just kicked you and you're the one saying sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, sometimes you can use it to your advantage. You can use that awkwardness to help. <laughs> this next question kind of sort of comes back a bit to what you were saying then. So making your stand-up debut in 1989, you became a regular on the Australian live comedy circuit. How did the comedy fraternity welcome you as a disabled comedian in the era before society's social awareness? <laughs> so I guess you said you didn't, didn't know. They didn't know. Most of them didn't know. Um, I... So I remember doing, I, I did a gig once, like early doors. I remember, so when I was emceeing, because I was, because I got to MC, I would do the early show and the late show. And um, because you'd have different comedians on each shows, but the, the host would be the same. And I remember this one night at the Sydney Comedy Store, m m there were only about 50 people in the second show. I think there were 250 in the first, 50 in the second. But of those 50, about 30 of them had been at the first show. So they had seen all my material. I had no new jokes for them. So I did a joke about my foot. I said, um, you know, I've got a prosthetic leg. Uh, and I said, um, I just get, I, it was something about, like, you know, you get weird questions. I was at a party once and a woman said, when I said, I've got a prosthetic leg, she said, can you still have sex? <laughs> and that was the end of the joke. It wasn't even a joke. It was just think about what happened. And I remember this comedian came up to me afterwards and said, um, you're not good enough to talk about your leg yet. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, you're, you, you're not good enough. You're not a good enough comedian to know what to. He said, you, firstly, you need to know why you're talking about your leg. And secondly, you need to be good enough at comedy that you can craft that into something really special. He said, if you, you need to wait. You need to apply your craft. You need to get really good at comedy. And then you'll work out how to talk about your leg the right way. And he was right. All I did was just tell a thing that happened to me for no particular reason. And then... You know, flash forward to 9-11, I found a reason to talk about my foot. Not only that, I had been nominated for the Perrier Award at the Edinburgh Festival. So not only did I have a reason, but I had proof that I was actually pretty good at what I could do. And so then all of that came together. And then that story, instead of just being, then I started telling the story about the woman that's saying, can you still have sex? And then I added to that, well, like my response would be, well, yeah, what does your boyfriend do? Does he take a run up? <laughs> And so all of a sudden, a funny thing that happened to me, I've added a punchline to, and then I found a reason to talk about it. Um, so for years, I just didn't talk about my prosthetic on stage, and no one knew, because, you know, you turn up, I'm in jeans or a, a pair of trousers or whatever. So the comedy community at the time didn't know. Like, people just didn't know. And I remember being at a barbecue once, 
um, you know, a comedian's barbecue. And I turned up in shorts and people were like, what's going on with your leg? And I was like, oh, I've got a prosthetic leg. And they were just shocked. People were shocked. But the really, really weird and interesting and patronising and I don't even know what other words describe this is that I've always been a pretty positive comedian and a pretty smiley bloke. And especially around comedy, I love doing comedy. I never really lost my temper backstage. I was just happy to be where I was. And I kind of got this, and, and my, my comedy in particular was very positive. I was always trying to be uplifting as much as possible. And I, once people realised that I had a prosthetic leg, they actually took my comedy more seriously. And the only thing I can think is that I kind of feel like they probably looked at me and went, well, of course you're positive. What's gone wrong in your life? Do you know what I mean? They were like, well, it's pretty easy to be positive, mate, when you've grown up in a cushy suburb with a nice family. You know, what about the rest of us that have had to go through hardships? And then when they found out I had a prosthetic leg, I think it, it's almost like it changed people's view of me and, went, and they went, oh, oh, okay, well, you are allowed to be positive then because you've, 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 you have overcome something. It was so, It was such a weird thing that people took me and my comedy more seriously even if I wasn't talking about my foot, just knowing that I had a prosthetic leg. So I, I don't know how to de describe why that would happen, but you know what I mean? Like if you, if you see someone who's positive and loving life, then you're suspicious of them <laughs> for some reason. But if you find out that they've overcome something, then you go, oh, okay, you're all right then. This led to your first stand-up tour, Stand and Deliver in 1997. Looking back now, what sort of landmark was this in terms of your career? Oh my goodness, enormous. So I remember going to the Edinburgh, no, sorry, not Edinburgh, the Melbourne Comedy Festival in the, at the beginning of 1997 um, and seeing a friend of mine, uh, a comedian called Joni J. Hill. So I was living in Adelaide at the time and there was a group of us in Adelaide doing comedy and she was the first to make that move over and do a solo show at the Melbourne Comedy Festival. And it just opened up my eyes to what, the, what was out there in the world of comedy and so off the back of that I then said I wanted to do um the Edinburgh Fringe Festival so I did Edinburgh before I did Melbourne <laughs> as far as um you know my, that was my first my first solo show was at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival <clears throat> and completely opened a new world of comedy to me I didn't know what the Perrier Award was I didn't know what reviews were any of that kind of stuff but I remember going back to Adelaide because I was working in radio at the time and I was offered a radio job, I think, in Newcastle. I was certainly offered another radio job somewhere and the boss of the radio station said to me, as, as a radio boss, I'm telling you this will be good for your career and you should take the job. And then he leant in and said, but as a friend who has just seen you come back from the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, you've got that look in your eye like you've seen Everest and now you want to climb it. So I think you should go and do that. And it was. It was Edinburgh became my grand final uh, in, in rugby league terms, my grand final every year. So I would go, I would do the Adelaide Fringe Festival in uh, February, March. I would do the Melbourne Comedy Festival in April. And then I would come over to the UK. I'd do previews and gigs and lead up to Edinburgh. I would do the Edinburgh Festival in August. I would take a month off and then I'd write a new show and I'd do it all over again. And everything I did, was leading up to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival as the pinnacle of my year. Um, but then you get bigger and bigger, and eventually Edinburgh isn't the pinnacle of your year. Edinburgh then leads into a tour that takes another two months and three months, and then you don't have time to write a new show for the next Adelaide Fringe, so you have to take a year off. And so, uh, yeah, that end goal for me wasn't wasn't there anymore. But, yeah, it, it, it was, yeah, complete a game changer, I think. In 2006, you made your debut on BBC Two's satirical panel show, Mock the Week. What was it about the British approach to satire that appealed to you? What did you learn from being on this show which helped you nurture your on-screen presence? Oof. I mean, the first thing I learned about Mock the Week is film a lot more than you need, because that, <laughs> that would be like, for a 50-minute for a TV show, they'd film about two and a half hours, sometimes three hours. <laughs> so I learned... First thing is, um, you know, not everything you see on TV is exactly what's filmed. Uh, what, what, I, I think 
it wasn't so much the 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 British satire that that kind of caught my eyes. The panel show, like the pan, the panel, the idea of a panel show, particularly when you had Mock the Week, um, Buzzcocks, Have I Got News for You. There were just so many panel shows on British television, and even now, you know, Have Would I Lie to You? It's a format that the rest of the world don't really nail. To the point where I remember when I ended up hosting Spicks and Specs, I had a few meetings in LA with a whole bunch of casting agents out there and producers, and I gave one of them a copy of Spicks and Specs. And he watched it, and he came back to me the next day, and he went, yeah, I watched your show last night, Adam. And I was all right. And he went, I don't get it. I was like, what? He said, it's just people talking, right? I went, well, yeah. And he went, and people watch that? He just couldn't get his, you know, American television has bells and whistles and, you know, stunts and all that kind of stuff. And he just couldn't get his head around the idea that people would just watch a group of people on TV have a chat. And yet, that's what we do in Australia. And that's certainly what we do here. I think I've, I've described The Last Leg as being like the daily show for a, for a country that likes to go to the pub. <laughs> so, you know, in America, you've got Jon Stewart in a suit or Trevor Noah in a suit looking down the camera, telling you stuff. But that's not what Britain does. Britain likes to see three blokes on a couch uh, or a bunch of people on a couch having a bit of a chat about the news. You know, it, the last leg, it's almost like a sitcom. It, it's, the three of us live together. It's like a sitcom where the three of us live together and, and every Friday night we just sit on the couch and talk about what happened in our weeks. So I think there's a specific type of television that is made here in Britain. Satirical, definitely. Um, but that panel show, that kind of conversation show that doesn't really happen anywhere else. 2012 was a breakthrough year for Paralympic sport, which culminated in Channel 4 winning the rights to cover the Paralympics in London. Never before had sport and light entertainment become so entwined in one big celebration. So what were your first impressions of The Last Leg and how did you think you could make a light entertainment show out of both disability and then an irreverent take on the day's sporting events? Well, it's interesting. So I, I had been, I presented um, opening and closing ceremony coverage of the Beijing Paralympics for Australian television. And that was my first experience with the Paralympics. And it absolutely blew me away. Like, I loved every second of it. My, my plan was to do the opening and closing and then see a bit of China in the middle, but I didn't. I just went to the Paralympics every day. Um, loved it but also saw the irreverent side of it. You know, I, I, I was hanging out with the physios and the coaches and they were all making the jokes that you can only make when you are deep, deep, deep within the disabled community. So I, when I got back from Beijing, I think even on the plane on the way back, I, I, I started writing down all the funny things I had seen for, to use them in stand-up. And I think maybe two or three days later, I was on stage in Chiswick and just went, I've just come back from the Paralympics, I have to tell you stuff, and went blah, and just blurted it all out. So I knew that there was comedy to be had in the Paralympics because I had spent a couple of years, you know, finishing my show with a 20-minute routine about what I saw at the Paralympics. I knew you could make it funny. Um, also at that time, the head of Channel 4, Jay Hunt, was an Aussie, and... She grew up as I did with a guy with a couple of guys called Roy and HG, who were comedians that presented late night irreverent coverage of the Olympics in Sydney in 2000. And so she kind of wanted a bit of a Roy and HG for the Paralympics. And so for me, as an Aussie as well, who already had a stand up routine about the Paralympics, I was like, yes, I know exactly how to do this. I, I know, know what you mean by Roy and HG. And, and they got to the point where they would have athletes in on the jokes that they would do. And, and the athletes would do stuff during their kind of mental presentations that were callbacks to Roy and HG. So I was like, okay, I know what you want. You want this kind of cult thing that the athletes can get into, but you also want to be irreverent about the sport. But on top of all of that, when I was in Beijing, um, there was a guy called Jason Helwig, who was the chef de mission of the Australian team. And he gave all of the journalists, got all the journalists together, all the media together, the Australian media, and he said, what you're about to see are elite athletes who have trained their asses off for the last four years to get to this point. They are the best of the, of the best in the world at what they do. If you cover the Paralympics that way, 
you'll be doing them justice. If you cover this as disability sport where everyone's inspiring, that's not what they're here for. These are athletes, first and foremost. So all of those things came together when it was time to do the last leg. I, you know, the irreverence of Roy and HG, knowing that you could be funny about disability, but knowing that in order to be funny about disability, you've got to emphasise the athletic achievement first. And so that's why every last leg during the Paralympics started with, we didn't start with the funny, we started with the gold medals. This is what happened today. This person won a gold. This person won a gold. This person did amazing stuff. Celebrate that first. Then you can talk about the funny. But if you go straight in with funny, you're just making fun of disabled people. So it, a lot of it all came together. And, then, and thankfully, there was a guy called Pete Thomas who was a sports producer who came on board and he just shaped the show. And he knew Roy and HG as well. And he knew exactly what my reference points were. So... Yeah, from the get-go, I was really confident that we could do this. But as soon as the first ad went on Channel 4 for the last leg, there were complaints from people going, how dare you call a Paralympic show the last leg? This is appalling. And it wasn't until they saw the first show that they went, oh, you've got, you, you're both missing leagues. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> uh, kind of following on from that, why do you think the last leg struck such a chord with the Channel 4 audience? Uh, I I think I mean I don't I, the best way to describe it is we 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 saw a thunderstorm coming we went out into a field we held up a golf club and we got struck by lightning so I think we did all the right things along the way um, I think the the chemistry between Josh and Alex and I was accidental like we didn't know it was going to be that good and in fact the first episode it was just meant to be me. Alex was a guest and Josh was doing the medal table. And then after that first episode, someone from the channel came in and went, no, it's got to be the three of you together. You guys, you, when you guys are on screen together, you bounce off each other. So there was a bit of accidental magic that came about um, and we're aware of it and we don't take it for granted. On top of that, I think it, there was also a combination of I remember in the lead up to the Olympics, people in London were so pessimistic about it. They were like, oh, we're going. I remember having cab drivers going, oh, mate, we're going to ruin it. We're going to, we're going to make a mess of this. London will absolutely bulge up the Olympics. You mark my words. And then the Olympics came and went. It was a success. And people were like, oh, I want to do something else. I want to do that again. That was great. I wish we had something that I could look forward to. And then the Paralympics came along. So already the whole nation was on it, was on a positive upswing. Also, because the Paralympics were on Channel 4, and not on the BBC, it wasn't seen as an afterthought. Channel 4 almost saw it as competition and went, right, let's wrap this up. And so then the big billboards went up that said, thanks for the warm-up, which is such a slap in the face. And then you follow that with that ad campaign that Channel 4 had with the public enemy song, Harder Than You Think, which suddenly made disability, well, suddenly made the Paralympics look cool and edgy. It was just a perfect storm of everything coming together and then you get to the end of the day and you've got us having a bit of fun about it in a way that no one's ever seen before. Yeah, it was a perfect storm. And we just, like I said, we held up the, the golf club in the middle of a thunderstorm and we got struck by lightning. saying when he interviewed Tanny Gray Thompson she said when you've got presenters presenting the Paralympics like a, a standard Olympics that's when things will change but you felt Josh felt that London went beyond that well yeah I mean well, I remember having a phrase at the time that Sydney was the first Paralympics where the athletes were treated like equals and London was the first Paralympics where they were treated like heroes 
And yeah, I think I think we treated it separately to the Olympics. And I think that's again that that was because we weren't on the same broadcast. We weren't on the and this isn't a diss on the BBC. We weren't. It doesn't matter who the broadcaster was. We weren't with the same broadcaster that had just finished covering the Olympics. We were on a completely different broadcaster because it's a completely different event. And I think, you know, there's always talk of the Paralympics being combined with the Olympics and there are pros and cons on both sides. But I quite like that the Paralympics is its own standalone event that has its own feel, its own atmosphere, its own sense of identity. Um and it, you know, in some in some ways, it's better. It's I mean, in many ways, it's better than than the Olympics. So, yeah, I I think it's 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 going to be an, an argument for the ages, I would imagine. But I love the idea of covering the Paralympics as the Paralympics, and you know, the the way technology goes, we know there will be Paralympians who are faster than Olympic Olympians. So, yeah, it, covering it just for what it is, for as I said, elite sport. In a slight, with a slightly different vibe. Yeah, that's. I guess that's kind of what we did. We're recording this a week after Gary Lineker's suspension from the BBC. However, on the last leg, you have gained a reputation for your political rants, which some have suggested may be slightly self-righteous. What's the process which you have to go on to find the perfect balance between edgy political comedy and political opinion? Well, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, I've, I haven't had a proper rant for a while now. <laughs> and, Partly because, and mainly because, the world got ranty. Like when 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 I started off in you know 2013, the the, the happy smiling Australian guy shouting at stuff in the news was kind of funny. And then it felt like by about 2016, everyone was shouting, whether it was over Brexit or Trump or Russia. There's a lot of shouting going on, and I kind of pulled back because I thought. I, a, it's not funny anymore, which is the whole basis for what I'm doing. But B, it's not helping. Like the, the kind of ridiculousness of, of of what was being said by people like Donald Trump or even Boris Johnson to a degree, it it felt like you can't be more ridiculous than that. You can't shout at people who are shouting at you. So so the, so to answer that question, I kind of pulled back on the rants a little bit. But yeah. Smug is a great word that often pops up on Twitter <laughs> after an episode in the last week. Um, it, it's really hard to find that balance. And what's what's interesting is sometimes, especially when you're talking about immigration or refugees, sometimes what you, what I think is a decent viewpoint will get the most amount of anger and people pushing back, and it. it yeah, I've had to I've had to kind of take on board the fact that what I think is what I think is some is often basic human decency um, can make people angry. But also, what I've learned is that it can be politicised, and sometimes the pushback on what I think is I remember being on Australian television and saying a whole bunch of things about refugees and, and being pro refugees, and then being accused of being a lefty in the press, and I was like, I didn't. I'm not even sure what my political leanings are. Uh, um, and the other interesting thing about the last thing is, you know, I've, I've been asked to represent various political parties or turn up at political rallies and stuff like that. And I always say no, because I'm not, I'm not aligned to a specific political party. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to give Labour a free ride just because they're Labour or, or, or any other party for that matter. And on the other side of the coin, I remember doing a stand-up gig, I think in Guildford, or might have been Swindon, where someone tweeted me before the show and said, "There's a there's a Tory councillor sitting in you know row seven, seat B, tear them a new one." And I walked down on stage and went, "But that might be a good council. Like I just because they're a Tory, I don't know this person. They might be really good at their job." So, ah, oh, it's constantly tricky. You're you're absolutely right. It's constantly tricky trying to walk that line of what I think is right is the right thing to do and say in any given point in any any moment whilst keeping on board that, you know, the viewers might have different opinions. Um, I, I, I'll be honest, I've almost reached a weird state of paralysis now when it comes to political opinions because there's so much pushback, whether it be on Twitter or in the media or, you know, even from the channel because you can't 
be seen to be biased one way or another. Um, and certainly with an election probably in the offing next year, I, 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 sometimes I have to pull back on political opinion. So it, it's almost at a point now where I let the guests have their opinions and I have to curtail mine a little bit. It's 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 increasingly tricky to answer your question. It's increasingly tricky. I missed a little bit of that, just so if you were offered the opportunity in the future to make a what kind of show for the BBC? A typical show for the BBC. What sort of process would you need to go through? Yeah. To to be able to do that. Yeah. Wow. Um I mean you could definitely do it. You could definitely do it. It's such a weird and there's nothing funny in this, by the way, but it's such a, a weird construct of Ofcom and what you can and can't say. And are we a news show? Are we a comedy show? Are we a satire show? You know, we were allowed to keep working during COVID because we were considered to be, um, you know, almost an essential show because people do get their news from us. And yet if you're a news show, you can't give a political opinion either way. And yet we're a comedy show, so we should be able to give a political opinion. Um you know, the same goes for the BBC. Like, it, the thing about the BBC, and especially at the moment, is the amount of people accusing them of Tory bias are about the same as the amount accusing them of being anti-Tory. And the, I th the same probably goes for us. And I think as long as you've got both both sides complaining about you, then you're probably doing the right thing. You're probably being impartial. Um, I, think you, I think you can set up a... You, you could set up a new satirical show on the BBC, but look, there are some governments and Australia has gone the same way. And I think America went the same way for a while where the, that feel that if you're on a public broadcaster, then you shouldn't be criticizing the government. But if you're in a public broadcaster, if it's a, a genuine public broadcaster, then you should be able to criticize everyone. Um, I think there's room for satirical comedy on the BBC, but it's, it's a, Again, it's a really, really weird one where, you know, Gary Lineker is a sports commentator, so he should be able to say whatever he wants privately, but he is also so much more than a sports commentator. But I, I think the, the, the job of the BBC should be to allow criticism. Three. Josh was saying uh, he's a bit of a TV anorak and he'd look at someone like David Frost in the 60s who was doing kind of more more stuff like that and it never harmed his career so oh look that's the thing we also live in a world where you, you can be as outspoken as you want and you've got to remember that a lot of the pushback especially a lot of the pushback comes from Twitter and a lot of that pushback is convicted it's it's you know, there's political reasons that uh, half the accounts that will criticize you, you have been set up by someone else with a fake name and it's a political group or, uh, you know, someone, someone's behind it that's got their own reasons for it. So it, it's very important not to take Twitter as gospel. And, you know, even when it comes to trans, the trans debate, 
I read a report recently that said that the acceptance of trans issues in Britain is way more than Twitter would have you believe. You know, you look on Twitter and you think, well, it's just these polarised arguments. But you've got to remember that something like only 6% of the population regularly use Twitter. So if, if 50% of them are vehemently pro-trans and 50% are vehemently against it, that's 3% on either side of the entire population. The other, you know, 84% are like, dude, we're fine with this. <laughs> Just do your thing. Um, vehemently pro-trans, I realise, is a terrible choice of words. But what I mean is this kind of, this aggressive one side fighting the other on any issue, regardless of what it is, um, it, it boils down to 6% of the population having an argument in the corner while the, while the other 94% are going about their daily lives. Britain has enjoyed a rich heritage of the charity Telethon over the last 30 years, with children in need and comic relief raising millions for those less fortunate. But in 2012, Channel 4 added the most recent charity Telethon, Stand Up to Cancer, to the entertainment landscape. Beyond children and doing our bit for international poverty, what is it about this tragic illness which makes it important to fundraise in this way? I think that it's, I think what's important about it is that it's everywhere. That it's, you know, I think it's, isn't it? The statistic they keep coming out with on stand up to cancer is that one in two of us will be touched by cancer um you know my dad died from leukemia uh pretty much everyone you talk to has got someone that they know uh and also the thing about it is that it's it's it can be research can change that you know we're, we're seeing that already the, the the recovery rates for certain cancers are, are much better than they used to be so it's kind of a simple thing in that um, it's it's a disease that touches so many people. Everyone's aware of it, and yet money can kind of help to fix it. Yeah. So yeah, it, it kind of boils down to that, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it, it is weird because you know, as you well know, there are other diseases that probably have a higher mortality rate, but that aren't as sexy. Um, unfortunately, but you know, cancer is an easy one to get your head around. Uh, it's an easy one to pour a lot of money into, um, and and results are coming. So all of those things come together, I suppose. put the cancer side to a side for one minute how do you think um the program has helped commercial tv realize that they can do a, te a telethon as well as public tv i guess oh i mean yeah i mean it's huge it's, it's such an enormous thing for channel four um but it, again for me it's the results i mean i think yes it's it's you can create a great night of entertainment which is what it is and it's always that weird balance that we have to strike between if it's just a night of entertainment people won't donate you, you need to have the the moments that hit home as well. But then if you have too many of those, people turn off. So you, you're trying to balance this weird thing of entertainment and getting people to donate uh, and, you know, hitting home as well and touching hearts. And it's, it's such a tricky thing to host because, you know, I, for me, the first one I hosted, I learned everything from Devon and McCall. I think, if, if you want to, the secret of making great live TV in the UK is either stand next to Davina McCall or Claire Balding. <laughs> because they know what they're doing. And I remember it was one, you know, because it's a crazy night because you're on the stage. It used to be anyway, where it used to be at the old uh, Westminster Hall, I think it was. So you'd be downstairs on stage introducing, I don't know, Liam Gallagher. And then you run through the corridors and then the next thing you're up on the roof with Davina and... I remember standing, getting up on the roof and going, right, what are we doing? And she's going, okay, 
we've got this comedy bit to do, but it's coming off the back of what I think is going to be quite a sad video. Have you watched this? And I went, no, I haven't. She went, well, you need to watch this. And so we're watching this video and it was just heartbreaking. And then she looked at me and she said, I don't think we can do jokes off the back of this. And I said, I don't think we can either. And she said, right, follow me. I'm going off script. And the video finished and it was devastating. We were both like tears. And we just talked naturally about how we felt. And then we moved on to the next thing. So it's such a draining, uplifting night as well, because by the end of it, you you go to the green room and there are people that you've seen in the videos who are now still with us and, or, you know, are kicking on. Um, so it definitely shows that, yes, you can combine that great television tradition of um, telethon and entertainment, but, also with with results and i think that's the great thing about stand up to cancer is that every year we come back and or every two years we come back and the chances of survival of certain cancers are better and better and so you kind of want to use that to spur people on to donate keep donating because we're getting there looking back at your career what's your proudest achievement <laughs> um uh, until recently I don't know if this is an achievement. My proudest moment was um, getting to introduce my dad to Rod Laver, the tennis player. <laughs> I think because it's such a it's such a crazy ass job that I do, and I'm not sure that my parents really quite understood. You know, the idea of being a stand up comic in 1989 in Australia, um, I, I think, was was kind of foreign, especially because I grew up in a very leafy almost nondescript part of Sydney. Um, and I'm not sure that my parents ever really quite got what I did, but there was one year where I went to the Australian Open and I got an invite to the Australian Open and I took my dad with me and we had a VIP dinner and, you know, my dad taught me to play tennis uh, and was a really good tennis player. And Rod Laver was there and he called me over to his table because he the people on his table recognised me. And so then I went, excuse me, and I called my dad over and I just got to say, Dad, this is Rod Laver. Rod Laver, this is my dad. And he was buzzing. I've never seen my dad quite that joyous. I remember that night he said he couldn't sleep. He was up until four in the morning because he'd met Rod Laver and he had the best night. And so for me, that's always been the highlight. I don't know, it's not necessarily my favourite achievement, but it's certainly my favourite moment. That might have been trumped by being awarded an MBE last year. But, but not just being awarded an MBE, being awarded for, um, what was it, services to Paralympic sport and disability awareness. Like, to to have that recognised, which was not what I set out to do in comedy or, or even with The Last Leg, to be honest. But I, that, that and, you know, my mum flew over from Australia for that. So I guess it was probably, yeah, it's a combination of introducing my dad to Ron Laver and having my mum there when I received the MBE. And then finally, what's next for Adam Hills? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've never really had a plan, to be honest. It's all, you know, the plan was stand-up comedy and then hopefully TV. And I've, you know, I've, I've tried to write movies or TV shows or pictures and they've never really come off. And then Spicks and Specs came out of nowhere. And then just as that finished up, the last leg came out of nowhere. Um, I've got... You know, I'm still I'm playing disability rugby league. I'm in Warrington at the moment because we played in Wigan yesterday. So I'm I'm in bits. I'm so sore. <laughs> but I want to do a bit more of that. Um, we'll keep doing the last leg. I mean, we're scheduled in for Paris next year. Um, and I don't know. I mean, there's a there's a possibility that I'm about to release a documentary about the disability rugby league World Cup last year. Disability tennis might be next on my radar. Um, but to be honest, I, I genuinely don't know. I genuinely don't know what's next. But for the next, for the foreseeable next couple of years, more last leg, more rugby league, and maybe a bit of tennis. But I, I, and I've always got that thing, and it comes back to exactly what we said at the very, very beginning about you know the natural abundance of Australia that gives us the energy to leave or the strength to leave will eventually draw us back home again. You know, if if I get to the end of twenty twenty four. And Channel 4 go, do you know what? We've probably had enough last leg. I happily go back to Australia and sit by the beach and do stand-up comedy again. Yeah. Lovely. Lovely.